Over the years, we've seen some incredible drivers go on long strings of dominant performances. The Formula One championships throughout the 1990s offered many different battles and a variety of drivers and constructors champions. In that decade, three drivers accounted for six of the drivers' titles, Ayrton Senna, Mika Hakkinen, and Michael Schumacher. In this video, we'll explore the latter two and the significance of Hakkinen's 1998 and 1999 titles. While it was clear that Schumacher was on the eve of something great and a red wave was coming, the Flying Fan refused to be another chapter in Schumacher's story, so he made his own. But how did we get here? This rivalry starts early and would require patience from Hakkinen who would be forced to watch after Benetton and Williams traded dominant season after dominant season. Mika was relegated to the sidelines, biding his time at McLaren. Let's go back in time to 1991 where we see young versions of the two superstars burst onto the Formula 1 scene. Mika would make his Formula 1 debut in 1991 after making the leap from Formula 3. After testing with Benetton, he opted to drive for Lotus in 1991. He suffered from unreliability but had three top 10 finishes and tallied two points to his name for a 16th place finish in the Drivers' Championship. His second season in Formula 1 was again with Lotus where he'd open up with a string of top 10 performances like a 9th in South Africa, a P6 in Mexico, and a P10 in Brazil. Early in the season, he'd swap to the Lotus 107 which proved to be a better car and would give him six more top 10 finishes, three of which were top 5 finishes. He'd end that 1992 season in 8th place in the Drivers' Championship with 11 points. Mika was on the hunt for a new seat for the 1993 season, but Collins wanted to keep the Fen. After two failed attempts to getting on a new team, his third attempt with Ron Dennis was successful and he joined the McLaren team for the 1993 season. Initially, he was slated to be a full-time driver at McLaren, but he stepped into the testing seat when Michael Andretti was signed. He got his big shot after Andretti would be fired for having a very poor season. The highlight for Andretti would be his podium finish in Italy. Hakkinen would step into the car in round 14 at Portugal. What was noteworthy about his debut outing with McLaren was that he outqualified his teammate Ayrton Senna in P3 where Senna started P4. This is also where Mika and Michael would get their first wheel-to-wheel -wheel fight while Mika's in the McLaren car. Hakkinen would be passed by Schumacher on the 25th lap. Just 8 laps later, Mika would make an error and put his McLaren into the wall. So he outqualified a legend, then he shunted into the wall. Bit of a mixed start for Mika. Michael, on the other hand, would end up winning that race and retiring the next two, as was the theme with Schumacher's 1993 season. He went on to win the 1994 and the 1995 Drivers' Championships. Like Hakkinen, Schumacher would make his Formula 1 debut in 1991. And also like Hakkinen, his contract was caught up in a bit of controversy, as he made his first outing with Jordan, but would only temporarily drive for Eddie Jordan's outfit. After it became evident the German was going to be a force to be reckoned with, Benetton swiftly engaged Schumacher and had him sign from the Jordan team where he would drive from round 12 through the end of the year. He would retire the car in the final two Grand Prix, but would beat his triple world champion teammate Nelson Piquet in two of his first three Grand Prix at Benetton. That following season in 1992, Schumacher would be stellar. He earned his first race win in Belgium and had a podium rate of 50%, even with four DNFs for a P3 finish in the Drivers' Championship. The following season, in 1993, he'd have even more early issues, retiring from three of the first six races, but appeared on the podium in the other half of the races that stretch. So now, we converge where we left off, with Hacken and shunting into the wall and Michael taking his second career victory. The two young drivers have more in common than we've discussed. In fact, this wouldn't be the first time that Mika would be collected by the wall after being passed by Schumacher. As it turns out, they actually have history racing together before Formula 1. Prior to them both making their splash in Formula 1 in 1991, they found themselves battling for the 1990 Macau Grand Prix Championship. The event attracts national champions from across the globe to compete against each other. Success in Macau is considered to have a high correlation with potential success in Formula 1, and for that reason, it's considered a very prestigious event for young F3 drivers. Hakkinen, who was the British Formula 3 national champion, was ahead after winning the first leg of the event, leading a young Michael Schumacher, who was the German Formula 3 champion. But in the second leg, Schumacher was ahead of Hakkinen. All the Finn had to do was stay 2.66 seconds clear to win on aggregate, which he was all race. After Schumacher's mistake at the exit of the Oriental Bend, Hakkinen went for it, and he made his move on Michael on the main straight but was covered off aggressively. Hakkinen collided with the back of Michael's car. He was unable to continue and Michael held on without a rear end and took the Macau Grand Prix victory on aggregate. This would be something that Hakkinen surely remembered, and it shows as it played out in the famous 2000 pass at the straight at Spa, but this time a Formula 1 title was on the line. While this was a rivalry full of fiery moments, the battle ran cold after Schumacher took the Macau Grand Prix World Cup. 
and I think, okay, he's playing with me. And in the last lap, you want to try it. And I think it's crazy to, to try it in the last lap. The two would compete in Formula One with few battles occurring, as Mika was in the McLaren car trying to get back to its 1980s former glory, but was struggling to find the right engine. He would have to wait seven seasons before he got his first win, dealing with car after car that failed to have enough reliability. Michael, on the other hand, had achieved 26 race wins and two driver's titles. So now that we've set the stage and we understand the backstory, we can expedite this battle and move to 1998 after Hakkinen gets his first win at the end of the 1997 season at the European Grand Prix. The 1998 season ushered in a shift in performance as changes made in the technical regulations required a reduction in the axle track by 8 inches. Tire suppliers were also now required to create grooved tires. Now that we're in 1998, McLaren have paired Mika Hakkinen next to David Coulthard. And through the early stages of this season, Michael Schumacher was merely an afterthought. Through round six at Monaco, McLaren had accounted for five of the six wins, with four of them going to Mika Hakkinen, and the other two split amongst DC and Schumacher. Headed into the seventh round in Canada, Hakkinen had a clear advantage at 46 points compared to Cothart's 29, and Michael Schumacher was sitting at 24 points. The next three Grand Prix saw a surge from the German as he went on a spree of victories. He took the checker flag in Canada, he took the checker flag in France, and he took the checkered flag at Silverstone. Meanwhile, McLaren suffered from errors and mechanical failures. After Schumacher's win in Silverstone, the lead was down to just two points, Hakkinen 56, Schumacher at 54, and DC at a distant 30 points. Hakkinen would crucially go on to take consecutive wins in Austria and in Germany. McLaren would also inch a little bit closer to the Constructors title, thanks to Coulthard helping the team finish 1-2 consecutively. Italy changed everything, in what would be Ferrari's 600th Grand Prix event, Michael went on to his shockingly first pole of the season, and the Scuderia taking only their second 1-2 finish all season long. McLaren had a dreadful Italian Grand Prix. DC's engine would fail from first place, which only compounded the situation when the smoke forced an air from Hakkinen. Schumacher then seized on that air and never looked back. Hakkinen's mechanical issues would only continue as he now had brake problems. Ultimately, he would scramble home for a P4 finish. Piling on to the momentum that Michael was gaining personally, this would be the first time in F1 history that brothers would appear on the podium together. And on top of all that, the championship battle was all squared 80 points between Hakkinen and Schumacher. Ferrari closed up on the Constructors' Championship to just 10 points. If the race ended after this round, Hakkinen would still be the victor on countback, but it's clear, the momentum is with the German. We head to the penultimate round where Ferrari again had a front row lockout. Eddie Irvine would get ahead of his teammate, but let him through and held up Hakkinen as best he could. Mika planned to run an overcut, which he would run longer on that first stint, as Schumacher pitted in the 24th lap. Irvine starting to do a good job on the rest of the field, holding them up to allow Schumacher to break away. He successfully gained the position in the pits, and Michael would begin to bear down on him. Despite the tremendous pressure that Michael would put on him, he ended up holding the position and taking the victory. Michael would have to settle for P2 and DC in P3. The four-point padding afforded Hacken in the cushion to get runner-up at the Japanese Grand Prix to clinch. Schumacher would go on to take his third consecutive pole, but would struggle yet again at the start, this time stalling out on the parade lap. And he too had to vacate his pole position and line up at the rear of the field. The pain for Schumacher would continue as he wouldn't finish the race thanks to tire failure. This instant, the driver's title was Mika Hakkinen's. Mika would take his world title, and Coulthard would finish P3 to help McLaren reclaim the Constructors' Championship. Let's take a look at the summary of the numbers after the 1998 season. Mika would earn 8 wins to Michael's 6. The two would be dead even at 11 podiums each. Hakkinen's pole dominance is really what stood out in 1998, as he took 9 compared to Michael's just 3. And only by the numbers, Michael gave Mika a really good fight in what surely is a weaker car compared to the MP4-13. But, even in a superior car, dominant drivers like Michael seize any opportune moment. Problem is, Mika was as consistent a driver as you'll ever find. Of the 16 races in 1998, Hakkinen finished off the podium just twice, once in Hungary and once again in Italy. His retirement in Belgium came after the second restart and a collision with Herbert Sauber. Outside of those events, Hakkinen was on pole and challenging for the win early, for the most part. This in turn also meant that Hakkinen would capitalize on mistakes from Schumacher, it became evidently clear that if Michael wanted to reclaim the title for Marinello, he was going to have to be in better positions at the start of the race and increase wherever possible the performance of the car, because the 1998 season was all Hakkinen. But the show must go on. As if to foreshadow for the season to come, we pick up right where we left off for the 1999 season. 
This includes Schumacher taking pole, Schumacher stalls in the parade lap, and Schumacher heads to the back of the grid. Hakkinen and Coulthard are now promoted up to the front row. And at the opening round of the 1999 season, McLaren would not be able to capitalize on this. Both of the drivers would experience mechanical failures, and both of them would retire. Eddie Irvine would go on to take his first career victory to start Ferrari off on a positive note for the Constructors battle. Round 2 in Brazil for the 1999 season saw more mechanical issues for Hakkinen as his car was stuck in third. Rubens Barrichello and Michael would be able to overtake, only to have the Finn get the spots back in the pits. After pulling ahead, Hakkinen would go on to cruise to another victory, and he would take this momentum to a pole lap in San Marino. But he would have a similar performance to last year, this time not finishing by losing control on lap 18. Coulthard would be passed by Schumacher in the pits, and Michael would take the first win of the season for him. DC's performance in P2 would mitigate the loss in the Constructors' battle, as Irvine would retire from the race. The Michael and Mika showdown made its way to Monaco, and unsurprisingly, Hakkinen was on pole. But this time, Michael got a good start and made the jump on Hakkinen and got ahead of him. After shoring up his position, he pulled away and never looked back. Mika would fall to third with Ferrari finishing crucially in 1-2 fashion. As this rivalry raged on, it was not looking good after the events of the Monaco Grand Prix for Hakkinen. Mika was sitting in third behind Schumacher at 26 and trailing Irvine's 18 by 4 points and was a single point clear of Frentzen, who sat at 13 points. And McLaren was behind Ferrari in the constructors' battle. They only managed five finishes of a possible eight between both cars. Ferrari enjoyed a 24 point advantage as they sat at 44 to McLaren's 20. But Hakkinen would finally make a stand. He would recover for a P1, P1, and P2 in the next three rounds. Schumacher's costly error at the Wall of Champions in Canada had him retire from the race. This midseason poise and form that Mika had just found would be absolutely critical in the title hunt. His comeback was complete, and he regained the lead over Michael in the championship ahead of the British Grand Prix by 8 points. Irvine would now sit at a distant 26 points. Mika's latest string of results would also bring McLaren to within 6 points of Ferrari at 58-52. to Michael needed to deflate the momentum that the Finn was now picking up, and he had a chance to do it at Silverstone. But Hakkinen would continue his pole dominance, and he'd start P1. But Michael interrupted the McLaren front row lockout. This lead would be washed away, and there would be trouble at the start for Michael, as he was now trailing his teammate after the lights went out. Undeterred, Schumacher saw an opportunity to make up the position at Stowe, but a failure in his car would result in a brutal crash. It's a miracle the German only walked away with a broken leg from the vicious incident. Meanwhile, Mika would be unable to distance himself any further, as he would too have to retire from the race. A McLaren car would still win, as DC could improve the team's points, but mostly were offset by Irvine's P2 effort. After the British Grand Prix, Hakkinen's lead over Schumacher remained steady at 8 as both had to retire from the race. McLaren would now pull within 2 points of Ferrari at 64-62. to We would later find out that Michael's wreck would lead to him likely missing the remainder of the season. Schumacher would in fact return to race in the final two events, taking both poles in Malaysia and Japan but Irvine and Hakkinen winning respectively. And while we can't know for sure whether Hakkinen would have maintained his lead to go on and win the championship had Michael raced all season, it's unlikely that Michael would have been able to stop the Finn from winning. He had all the momentum at that point and was already leading Schumacher by 8 points. Furthermore, to address the objection that Mika only won because of Michael's absence, let's not dilute Irvine's performance. In 1998, Michael would win two races following the British Grand Prix where he would start his 1999 absence. Irvine would go on to win on three separate occasions after Silverstone. Additionally, the 1998 fight was so close because of Michael's stellar midseason performance. That season, he would be the only driver to actually take three consecutive wins. So up until his 1999 injury, he had managed only two wins and a 57% podium rate. The season prior, he managed a 71% podium rate while matching his two wins through the first seven races. Overall, the Finn was likely too strong in 1999. So if you take anything from this, at least be open to the fact that Mika won on merit and Irvine had a pretty incredible season, all things considered. And as mentioned, one of his victories the rest of the season was in Malaysia at the penultimate race for the 1999 season, which would be instrumental in securing the 1999 Constructors' Championship for Ferrari. That race would not be without controversy, though. A win in Malaysia put Eddie four points ahead of Mika in the Drivers' Championship and Ferrari four points clear of McLaren. Schumacher did a wonderful job in blocking both McLarens all race long, and Irvine would take the checkered flag followed by Schumacher and Hakkinen. After the race, the Ferrari barge boards were deemed illegal, and the results were thrown out. With them disqualified, effectively, it made McLaren the champions. It would mean that Hakkinen would be the 1999 driver's champion. But Ferrari would immediately appeal, and they would actually win that appeal. 
The successful appeal was granted in large part due to the delegates' measuring process of Ferrari's barge boards. The appeal was specifically approved on the grounds you can see on the screen right now, and the points were reinstated, both drivers and constructors. Max Mosley was quoted after saying, Ferrari were just within the tolerance permitted. It was a millimeter or less on each dimension. They were absolutely on the limit. So here we are. Yet again, the final showdown was at Suzuka. Yet again, Schumacher would take pole. And yet again, Hakkinen would claim the top spot off the start getting way better. Hakkinen's drive in Japan in 1999 was truly impressive. The weight of Schumacher, Irvine, and all of Italy bearing down on him. He kept his steely reserve and made no mistakes. DC would do a bang-up job holding back Irvine who desperately needed Michael to pass Hakkinen in order for Irvine to win the championship. Even if they tied, it wouldn't be good enough. Mika was ahead on countback. But there was nothing that Schumacher could do. The Finns stayed steady and took the win at the 1999 season finale. And this drive subsequently secured his second consecutive driver's title. In the midst of holding up Irvine, DC actually went off and it would eventually spell the end of McLaren's constructor's hopes. Ferrari had done enough to return the Constructors' Championship back to Marinello. They ended the season with 128 points to McLaren's 124. Taking a look at the tail of the tape, we can see that Mika and Michael by the numbers of 99, and of course this excludes Michael's missed races due to injury, Mika would win 4 of those races to Michael's 2, Mika would have 7 podiums to Michael's 6, and Mika would have 6 pulls to Michael's 3. A real changing of the guard was here though, Ferrari was back powering off the momentum from their claimed Constructors' Championship of the 1999 season, and a new driver pairing that put Michael next to Rubens Barrichello, Ferrari would sweep the early 2000s. But when exactly did Michael's reign truly begin? To finish off the last chapter of the Clash of the Titans, Michael and Mika face off in the 2000 season. Tune in next time to see Schumacher bring all of the glory back to Marinello. Check back here on Cranky Yankee F1 YouTube channel to get the series finale to see how this rivalry ends. The series finale and final episode will premiere May 2nd at noon Eastern Standard Time or 1700 BST. Thanks for your time as always, and I'll see you very, very soon.